So I'll present the results of some research that I did with my colleague John Gowdy that was supported by RPI, Red Star Polytechnic Institute, and also my employer, NYSERDA. And what we wanted to do, we wanted to investigate what the effect of providing local climate change impacts would have on people's, New Yorkers, opinions about climate change, their concern, their recognition of consequences, and their support for uh, regulatory controls as well as willingness to take responsibility personally, which is really the more important thing we were interested in. So our hypothesis was that local um, frames in combination with people's environmental motives would have an interactive effect to influence their attitudes towards climate change. And so we used uh, Wes Schultz environmental motive survey to, it's a tripart classification system to type our respondents by egoist, biospheric, and social altruist. And so egoists are most influenced or most concerned about environmental problems as they are expected to affect themselves personally, their health, their wealth, and their immediate circle of people. And so we thought egoists would be more influenced by local climate change impacts. And biospherics are most concerned about environmental problems as they affect all species in the world. So we thought they'd be more influenced by global impacts. And social altruists, since they're most concerned about environmental problems as they affect all people in the world, we also thought they'd be most influenced by global change impacts. So um, our study consisted of a Qualtrics panel. It's, Qualtrics is an environmental survey company, and we bought a panel of representative New Yorkers, equally represented from downstate and upstate. And um, 276 um, were, was our panel size. We were, we were really aiming for 300. That's what we purchased. But we really went through more than 1,000 um, surveys before we were able to get a group of survey responses that actually read the information treatments. And I'll, I'll talk to you about that. <clears throat> and they were randomly assigned, both the upstate and downstate respondents, to receive either <clears throat> a one-page description of global climate change impacts, and by, sorry, you can't read that, so it's by um, expected impacts on average temperature change, on sea level rise, on, um, I can't even read it, and economic impacts, and um, species losses. <clears throat> and the same was done for New York State specific impacts, and those two information treatments were carefully balanced so that we wouldn't introduce bias, that one was more um, dangerous or catastrophic than the other. And so <clears throat> we used Q methodology to both structure the survey and to analyze the results. <clears throat> and what Q does, it correlates uh, participants' responses across a set of idealized factors. So it sort of fi finds the centers of gravity in, a, in the viewpoints. And so the outliers are sacrificed for the, the main viewpoints or the main perspectives. And that's what we were interested in. And it's been likened to like an ecologist intensively surveying a small plot of land to make, um, to make uh, uh, descriptive statements about a larger piece of land. So in Q, the, the study population is typically smaller, but they're giving you many more data points. Usually they're, they're ranking a set of statements from 30 you know, up to 40 or, or 60 even. So you're getting a lot of information from each individual. And so what happened was, back to the information treatment, we found that I put in, I'm glad I did, I put in um, validation questions, three validation questions after uh, we, we presented two, two paragraphs of information to the respondents at one time. Then we asked them a question, a multiple choice question, you know, were sea levels expected to rise four to six inches, two to four inches, or six to eight inches, and they would have been easily, uh, they would be able to easily answer that question if they had read the paragraph, because it was just two paragraphs, and then they were asked, well. Is the type this small? <laughs> <laughs> but we um, found that people weren't reading the information treatment, and since that's what we were interested in, I was very glad we include the validation questions. So that's a kind of a, a lesson to be learned for surveyors. <clears throat> so in this case, the um, participants ranked 30 statements based on a forced Gaussian distribution. They were asked, okay, of all of those 30 statements, and they were, we can go into the raking process later, but they were asked to select three statements they most agreed with and three they most disagreed with, and then there were more statements in the middle that they had lesser degrees of agreement or disagreement with. And the statements 
were um, developed to give us insight on people's concern about climate change, the consequences they expected, their personal responsibility, or if it was a government solution that was what we needed. And based on the um, environmental motives survey, um, more than 50% of the respondents typed out as social altruists, which is consistent with Wes Schultz and colleagues' work with the environmental surveys. And we then, about a third typed out as biospherics, and 16% typed out as egoistic. And this represents um, 206 of our respondents. So we dropped 70 respondents from the analysis because they were spread over more than one environmental motive. And we wanted just to look at what was going on with the uh, environmental motives. And so we had six different groups that were factor analyzing separately. And then I compared those factors or those viewpoints between the six groups just to see how the information treatment, local or global, interacted with the environmental motives. As you see, the, you know, the smallest group was the, the egoistically motivated individuals that got the global impact information. So first, consequences and concerns. This was a surprise. Okay, you heard our hypotheses, but they, were, they, weren't, they, they really weren't true. Our hypotheses were not found in the data. So remember, the social altruists represent more than 50% of the people, so that band should be 50% you know, of the, 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 the depth of that graph. And then the biospherics were 33% and the egos were 16%. But you see, the provision of local and global impact information did not matter, and all of those environmental types were equally concerned about, they believe that global warming will have serious consequences worldwide. That's the statement they were, they were ranking as most strongly agree with. They also felt positively that Global warming would have serious consequences for their community, but um, and it's it's it's, really, it's a um, egoistic. The group were most concerned about consequences to their community, which is consistent with that environmental type. But again, there was no difference between the local or global treatment. And again, they believe that human-caused global warming is occurring. Mm -hmm. That was consistent across all three, um, with surprisingly the biospherics not agreeing as strongly with that statement as the other motives, but still no difference in information treatment. Everybody believed it's important to reduce CO2 today, while there's still an opportunity to avoid irreversible damage. There was also a strong sense of intergenerational responsibility, because this is a disagreed statement. They do not believe that future generations would be more likely, more able to deal with the effects of climate change than we are. But in this case, the provision of local impact information affected the biospheric group more than the global did. And that's 33 percent of our population. So the local impact information appears to be, have a stronger influence on a third of the population for intergenerational concern. And economic issues do not trump environmental concerns. They all disagreed that we should do everything we can to get the economy back on track, even if it makes the environment suffer. And in this case, the provision of local impact information had a greater influence on that response, because the biospherics represent 33 percent and the ghost 16 percent. So in turn, this is where it gets a little more interesting. In terms of personal responsibility and willingness to change, um, all of the groups make, feel like they make a, an effort to recycle and reduce and reuse. But the biospherics um, report a stronger agreement with that statement, followed by social altruist and egoist. And that's consistent with you think of the number, the audience that's going to be impacted, all species, human species, or immediate family and friends. Um, when we talk about looking forward, I plan to increase my efforts to conserve energy and use renewable energy from my utility when I can afford it. Again, local impact information had a stronger influence than global, um, and specifically with biosphere, with a third of the population. <clears throat> All groups felt that they would like to drive a more fuel efficient vehicle and take to public transportation when possible and save in other ways to reduce fossil fuel use. And again, here, local impact information had a stronger influence on that response with almost 50 percent of the, the group surveyed.
So there wasn't a moral licensing effect. The, the, the concept that, well, we can use as much energy as we want as long as we buy carbon offsets to mitigate footprints. They all disagreed with that statement. But here, the provision of local impact information, the Green Bar, New York State specific, had a stronger influence. Thanks. Surprisingly, only the egoistic group that were provided uh, local impact information said that they were interested in buying a hybrid vehicle as their next vehicle. And that made me think maybe the purchase of hybrids is, has something to do with extrinsic values. I think egoistic motivated um, or would be more, um, more influenced by extrinsic concerns. None of the groups, re in fact, the egoist, they, they, they re replied that they were not interested in getting involved with the local climate change action group. So nobody was interested in getting involved with the community group. That doesn't mean, of course, that they might not if they were provided the opportunity, but if you just ask people, no, they're not interested. <coughs> Support for policy solutions. In this case, we saw that the provision of global inf impact information had a stronger influence on support for um, environmental tech transfer from industrialized countries to less de developed countries. And also, um, everybody, all groups, agreed with the fact that all countries, there should be government mandates in all countries for their citizens to reduce their global impact with the provision of global impact information having a stronger influence than local. So just to summarize the findings, the global change impact information influenced support for international agreements and, and mandates, government mandates, clean energy transfer, and the local climate impact information supported feelings of personal responsibility and intentions to reduce energy use in the future, as well as intergenerational responsibility. And it also it increased support for environmental solutions, even when there might be economic consequences. So we explain this, these findings that we think that you know providing local impact information you know gives a, a local frame it makes an abstract and distant problem seem more vivid more tangible and it's perceived as possibly having more near term consequences and local frames could stimulate a sense of personal responsibility because after all it's in your own backyard and also they engender feelings of self efficacy it's a local problem, we have something to do with it, and actually we can do something about it. It's just all in perception. And global climate change impacts, they support you know, multilateral policy mandates and other governmental solutions because that problem is framed as like a bigger than me problem, so I can't do anything about it. It's an international problem. So closing, think local and you will act, and both your region and the world will benefit. Um, what we hope to do is to take some of these findings and, and, and apply them in behavioral pilots in New York State. We're in my program at, at NYSERDA, we're, we're working with action research and other academics to, to apply insights from the social sciences in energy behavior related situations and controlled experiments to see if we can't address that efficiency gap, what the difference between what is cost effective, what is a rational choice, and what is being done. So we, we think we have to get at it sort of using those behavioral insights. And we have a lot of pilots. And this is actually a plug for my program. If you're involved in running a clean energy program in New York State, we have free technical services from Action Research to provide to help run experimental pilots to test different approaches using social um, and psychological insights to behavior. So, and so we hope to do that and also to be able to continue the research and apply um, information about local climate change impacts to New York State at a more granular level, at even more sub-region or community level, because there was recently a report that was published by the New York Academy of Sciences on um, climate change, um, projected climate change impacts and mitigation and adaptation strategies for New York State. And, um, I can give you the link to that website if you're interested in, in a getting a copy. So thank you.